and shock the nation. But 30 years later, little has changed. We jump from one camp to another. You know, that's the life of a migrant. In one migrant family's journey, Frontline discovers how precarious their lives still are. Farm workers remain outside the mainstream, excluded from most benefit programs that other Americans take for granted. Tonight on Frontline, New Harvest, Old Shame. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston, this is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. It was the night after Thanksgiving in 1960 when Edward R. Murrow told America its treatment of migrant farm workers was a harvest of shame. The impact of that CBS documentary was so powerful that over the years it has become a kind of historical marker to which we return periodically to measure our country's progress toward equity and justice for the least powerful among us. This year, Frontline decided to make that journey Producer Hector Galan and correspondent Dave Marish spent six months traveling thousands of miles along the migrant trail, talking to the workers and the growers, the activists and government officials. Along the way, they discovered that in many ways, for migrant farm workers, time has stood still. We call their report, New Harvest, Old Shame. Bell Glade, Florida, in the hours before dawn. Soon these workers will be shaking oranges out of trees, slashing sugar cane out of rows, picking the corn, beans, tomatoes that are the harvest of the Florida sun of 1990. This is Florida. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. This is a shape up for migrant workers. One farmer looked at this and said, we used to own our slaves, now we just rent them. 30 years ago, when Edward R. Murrow exposed the desperate lives of America's migrant farm workers, he began in Bellglade. This is Bellglade, Florida, where the exodus has its beginning every year. In 1960, the migrant farm workers who wintered in Bellglade lived in shacks most of them were black Americans. Their pay was just a few dollars a day. Today, Belglade is a city of recent immigrants, mostly Haitians. They live surrounded by crack and AIDS. The estimated income for a farm worker family is less than $6,000 a year. And in 1990, the life expectancy for a migrant is still only 48 years. Growing up in a place like this would have to affect you. Building after building after building, three floors of just nothing but humanity packed into these places. I mean, just amazing. Farm worker advocate Jim Boone showed us through this block of single rooms that rent for $42 a week. You're not supposed to cook in this place. And you're packed in with everybody else. There's no air conditioning. I mean, the windows might open. They're supposed to open. And you get a bathroom that works probably, I'd say, one week out of the month, if that. And then this is the bathroom that's really not working. The steps in here is awful. Well, you can see that uh, there's a reason for that. I don't think any of these toilets look to be functioning. It just doesn't well, seem is... right. This is 1990. Since Ed Murrow came here 30 years ago, new laws have decreed improved standards for farm worker housing and medical care, improved access to Social Security and unemployment benefits. The federal government today spends half a billion dollars a year on farm workers. But standing here in the middle of Belglade, you have to wonder why all that money and legislation hasn't bought the better life migrants thought they were promised. From towns like this throughout Florida and throughout the South, the two to three millions move out on their annual migration, which ends in late November. 
In 1990, of America's estimated 4 million farm workers, 800,000 are still migrants. And in the spring, they follow the same trails north as they did 30 years ago. Up the road from California to Washington, from Texas to Ohio, and from Florida to the fields of Indiana. It is 6 a.m. on a September morning near Orestes, Indiana, at the end of the migrant trail. This family left Florida in April, stopping in Georgia to pick onions before moving here to the cucumbers and tomatoes of Indiana. The family's leader, 40-year-old Pedro Silva, has been a farm worker since he was eight. To move from one state to another, from work to work. We're hoping to be a good year. You know, we're hoping it'll be a good year, because we ain't made no money. We're trying to make some money right now. Put some food on my table, pay my bills. So we're hoping, you know, it's going to be all right. We are all here. My father is here. My mother is here, too. Back at camp, Pedro's wife, Reina, earns extra money cooking for other families. Now 40, her picking days are over. I work all day. Sometimes I get very tired. I only fill the buckets and one of my sons or my husband will take them to the truck. In this work, you only see young people. There are older people, but they are not really that old. In the field, Reina's 62-year-old father, Gregorio, still picks his share, while his wife, Fidelia, helps her daughter in the camp. The grandparents have been migrant farm workers all their lives. They've been American citizens for years, but now face old age without the protection of a pension or health insurance. Field work is very hard. But because field work is all that we know, we have no choice. Since we have to work, we must work at whatever we can. Otherwise, what are we to do? The family's two teenage sons are still learning farm work. This is 14-year-old Mario's first season, and he hates it. But his 17-year-old brother, Nazario, says he likes field work. Crew leader Lauro Garcia has hired Pedro's family for the last three seasons to pick the tomatoes on the 870 acres of Gary Reinert's Red Gold Farms. The only thing I can assure them that they do have a job. I do my best that to make sure that they've traveled this distance and they're comfortable with their surroundings and that they do have a capability of making money. And when they make money, I can make money. Red Gold Farms processes and ships its own produce around the U.S. Gary Reinert says his family-owned corporation is very profitable. It spends 40% of its revenue to harvest the crop, including $50,000 each season to maintain the migrant camp. Farm workers are paid 35 cents for each bucket of tomatoes they pick. Do you think that these workers are getting a fair share of the wealth of America's fields? I don't know if it's me to judge what is, what is fair. I, I, all I can say that the migrant worker does a great job for us, and, and uh, at this point in time, we, we could not do without the migrant worker. When the picking is done, the workers and farmers separate. The workers' camp is theirs alone, a place of simple bunkhouses provided rent-free by Red Gold Farms. The communal bathrooms are down the alley, and so are the shared laundry and kitchen sinks. In a single room divided by a bed, live Pedro, Reina, Mario, and Nazario. Theirs is a world of cramped muscles and cramped quarters. Here, even privacy is shared. 
Day's end is time to count the tokens earned for each tomato bucket filled. 75 buckets apiece for Mario and Nazario, earning them each $25, an average day. Last year, Pedro's family of four cleared about $10,000 picking crops. That's almost twice the average for today's farm workers. Pedro and Reina say life here in Indiana is as good as it gets on the migrant trail. That's why I say I'm more comfortable here, because here I make a little more money and everything seems to be calmer. We have it so much better here. Fifteen years ago in nearby Warren, Indiana, migrants took over a tomato processing plant for 11 days after they'd been refused promised jobs. By the time federal marshals moved in, an alliance had been formed between the workers and the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, FLOC. The union's leader was, and is, Aldemar Velasquez. To us, that barricade was the last symbol of the wrongdoing that was done to us. And we started challenging them and said, look, you know, it's a double standard. And when we started challenging those things, the response was hostile, the response was fear, the response was uh, retaliating, try to put us in our place. They didn't like what was happening. By 1978, Flock had organized 2,300 farm workers and was pressing its case for better pay and better working conditions all across the Midwest. They're going to go past their tomato fields. We're going to go down their county roads and to show them that we're not afraid. We didn't want anything to do with them. Wally Wagner was one of hundreds of farmers who felt the union's pressure. A farmer is very independent. A farmer don't like anybody else telling him what to do nor when to do it. Flock's strategy was to improve conditions in the fields by targeting the brand name processors who bought the crops. Flock called a strike against Campbell's Soup and its tomato farmers and led a national consumer boycott against Campbell's products. In 1986, after eight years of struggle, Campbell's and its farmers finally signed a contract with the union. We agreed to accept unionization. We not only agreed to accept it, we agreed to not try to eliminate it. And I had spent some time visiting in California, and I had seen from experience there that the guy that got hurt with the union was the guy that tried to fight it. Today, after every harvest, Flock distributes bonus checks to its members, usually about $300, a share of the farmer's profits. The new contract also increased wages by 40%, and for the first time, gave the farm workers paid health insurance and their first paid holiday, Labor Day. They're beginning to know and understand that, that they're hardworking people and that hardworking people deserve to get paid a fair day's pay for a fair day of work. And you can uh, uh, better the circumstance that your family's in and that you do deserve uh, to be in an equity situation with other workers in other industries. We've made a lot of headway here in the last couple of years, but uh, prior to that, um, the changes weren't uh, weren't very great at all. Um, I know a lot of people like to point to, well, there's better laws and better this and that, you know, but um, uh, the bottom line is that uh, we're still, uh, the piece rate for the crops that we worked were still low. Uh, certainly not anything that you could uh, support a family on. The child uh, labor, the presence of the young people helping the, the older people in the family is a, is a constant presence in the industry. The labor camps, you know, the, the typical uh, one-room, two-room shanties uh, have prevailed over the years. But these are some of the things we're trying to address now and working jointly with the companies and the growers. But uh, 
um, throughout the years, you know, that's that's been the, the standard situation, and the, the changes have not been very great. And people don't like changes, and people don't like to have their uh, the way they're used to doing things changed. But it's got to it's, it's got to come. It's got to happen. Yeah. In Indiana, by mid-October, the harvest is in. And at the Red Gold Camp, it's moving day. This is the third time Reina and Pedro have moved this year. I tell my husband I like it here much more than in Florida. In Florida, we have nothing. No one has anything. Over there, people are barely surviving. We don't get to carry a lot of stuff when we move from one place to another. We got to keep all our stuff together and keep it down to a size where we can carry it. We got to be able to do everything, you know, cook. We got a small stove, you know, where we can cook in there. We got a bed, got a clothing, you know, we got everything in there. I have no relatives over there. But here, we are all together. We are not anxious to get there. For Reina's nine-year-old niece, Sonia, moving day also means leaving behind a school and a teacher. They have all withdrawn from school. They are moving back to their home bases. Within the past week and a half, we have lost all the children. Zaina Hall is packing today, too. It's real hard. In those seven weeks, you've become very close to those kids. And um, for many of them, it seems to take several weeks before you really see them to really start beginning to um, grasp hold of what you're trying to teach them. So it's really sad when they leave, knowing that you're just really getting started. And here they are leaving already. So every time they move, they have to find a new way to fit in. Some of them say that once they leave here, they don't even go to school. And financially, for them, many of them to even think about finishing high school and trying to go to college probably looks like an impossibility. The saddest part is knowing that if I could have them for a whole year, how much I could do, you know? And that doesn't mean that I'm a great teacher or anything like that. I just think that the, the continuity of being in one place for one whole year they probably would even be surprised at how much they could learn. And I think it's so sad when they um, have to move so much and they are not allowed to work to their capabilities. She told me that, that are you leaving today? She, and I told her yes. And, and then when I told her yes, she told me, I felt sorry that you're leaving. I wish you could stay here with me. She was like a mom to me. You get very attached to many of them, and uh, every year it happens the uh, same way. I guess I feel a closeness and a sadness there when they leave. It's very emotional. Mm -hmm. By noon, Pedro's caravan moves out. Six vehicles carrying the 15 men, women, and children of his extended family and all their possessions. The trip south to South Carolina and then on home to Florida will cover 1,300 miles. Everything I own is from my vehicle. So I got everything in my truck. It's all I own and that's all I have. That's all we have. Due to the extensive rain, our yields were cut basically in half. And when our yields are down, I'm not making any money, and they aren't either. For Pedro's family, the poor harvest means that they're heading south with only $1,400 for their six weeks of work. That's less than half what they made in Indiana last summer. Barely a hundred miles south of Orestes, the caravan stops. Something's wrong with the fuel pump in Pedro's truck, which he bought for $7,000, the savings of five seasons. My biggest worry, it's uh, breaking down. 
having to break down somewhere, middle of nowhere. You can get the parts. That's one of the biggest words there, you know. Soon it's lunchtime. For a family on a poverty budget, nothing is simple. Even a fast food meal for 15 would cost $50. So this family cooks whenever it can. South Carolina is more than 600 miles down the road. It's 1,200 to South Florida. Minutes later, another stop. It's the brakes this time and another three-hour delay. In six hours, they've covered barely 150 miles. When morning arrives on the second day of the journey, the family is barely over the Kentucky line. So far, gasoline and food have drained $150 from their earnings, and South Carolina is still 500 miles away. They're behind schedule, and so by 7 o'clock on this Sunday morning, after a cold breakfast, they're moving again. Eleven a.m. It's the truck again. This time, it's more serious. The engine has seized up. There's more to worry about than lost time. The truck is the centerpiece of Pedro's plans for the future. When he's able to afford one more vehicle, a bus, he'll have enough transportation to become a crew leader. And that could double his family's income. By noon, it's clear. The engine is beating Pedro's skill with his tools. Finally, Pedro gives in and calls a tow truck. We've been working five years just to have this truck, you know, and that's where I make my money, how it gets me to work, you know. It's my everything. The bill for the tow is $35. Pedro can't afford the several hundred dollars for repairs. Having to think I'm going to have to leave $7,000 just on the road, you know, between here and nowhere. It's like, kind of like uh, leaving everything behind. I'll be back later on for, you know, okay. two or three days, you know, whatever it takes. I'll be back. Pedro has discovered the engine failed because someone back in Indiana had put salt in his gas tank. It's been a long and costly day. Now there are only about $1,000 left from their Indiana earnings. As the family sleeps, Reina's father keeps watch. In a rest stop outside Knoxville, Tennessee, the second night of the journey dissolves into the third dawn. South Carolina is less than 300 miles away. Under a cloudy sky, humidity 97 percent. Wind from the east at 7, the barometer rising from 3011. And at 738, the temperature on Peachtree Street is 65. I'm meteorologist Kurt Mellish of the AM 750 WSB Weather Center. This morning's top story is... Late morning, more trouble. One of the cars has overheated. And there's worse news. The family had planned to stop over in Charleston for three weeks to pick tomatoes. But last week, Hurricane Hugo roared through South Carolina, and now there are no crops to pick. The $1,000 in potential earnings have also vanished. No, pero si no quiere comer, no quiere comer Late afternoon of the third day. Pedro's four-year-old nephew, Jose, is feeling sick. 
He'd been hospitalized just two weeks ago in Indiana. We don't ever know what's going to happen, so... But it's tough for kids. At 10 o'clock, the caravan pulls up to an emergency room in Charleston. I think it's his throat. He has throat, it throat? throat infection on it. He has lymph nodes here and here, and his throat is real red. The back of his throat is real red. Even his ears are being affected. Okay. How long are you going to be in the Charleston area? Huh? How long are you going to be in Charleston? I'm going to pass on it. Hmm? I'm going to pass on it. And pass tomorrow? Yeah. You're here tomorrow? Uh, yeah, tonight. Tomorrow? Leaving tonight? Okay, and where are you going from here? To Florida. To Florida. Okay, well, you can check with the doctor in Florida if he's not better in a day or two. He gets worse. Are you driving tonight, all night? Maybe. Maybe. Gosh, you really are trying to see. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give him some medicine. Start him on it tonight. Give him one dose tonight and then tomorrow three times a day. The family has no medical insurance. The emergency room and penicillin cost $48. At midnight, they cross into Georgia, headed home to Florida. The morning of the fourth day near the Georgia border. Most rest stops like this one forbid overnight camping, so the family always pulls in after midnight to avoid any trouble. Three days of gas, food, and emergencies have now shrunk their Indiana earnings to about $800. <clears throat> The bathrooms were locked when they pulled in last night. They finally reopened at 7. There's some good news this morning. Little Jose is feeling better. November, the last of the laborers in trucks, buses, and cars approach the southern states to start the cycle all over again. The Sunshine State welcomes them back. Thirty miles south of Miami is the Everglades migrant camp the family calls its home base. The 400 trailers here date from World War II. At the peak of the season, this camp will be overflowing with 8,000 people. Pedro remembers the bad plumbing and some bad neighbors. He's not thrilled to be back. Sonia is thrilled, though, to see her father again. Jose Martinez, married to Reina's younger sister, had stayed behind to work the summer here. He and Jose Jr. share their first hug since April. Unlike Indiana, this is not free. The last of their earnings go to pay two months' rent. It's sad coming down here, but at the same time, we're happy because, you know, we're here. We call it a home, but this we ain't got no place else to go. It's the best we can do. The trailer has three bedrooms and indoor plumbing, but it's unfurnished, just a refrigerator and stove. My greatest wish is to have a home. That way, we know we always have a home to return to. These are my hopes after going from one place to another, to have a home we can return to. Last year I brought, what, $6,000. This year I only brought 1400 
which is no money, which I already wasted coming from Indiana down here. You know, it's my last $500 I had, and I'm flat broke, you know. It's been bad all year round, and we're all hoping it's going to be good. This year in South Florida, the crops ripened late and fewer fields were planted as Miami developers bought up more and more farmland. Six weeks later, Pedro had still found no work in the fields. It's looking bad. I mean, places where they used to plant a lot of tomatoes, you know, 400, 500 acres of tomatoes. They're going to be planted this year. Pedro was able to fix his big red truck, but it was expensive. He had to borrow to cover the $1,200 for another engine and the trip back to Kentucky. And now, with no work in the fields, Pedro is scavenging for scrap metal. Cast iron, it's $4 every 100 pounds. Transmissions are worth $240 per pound. People just kind of, uh, they don't need it no more, you know. It's old junk, they just throw it out there or they just pile it up somewhere, you know. So we have to go and dig it out, you know, get it out, sell it. You can only run it so much, you know, to run out. Then you have to find something else to keep going for a while. There's another reason Pedro's having trouble finding work, competition. In Florida, there are an estimated three farm workers for every available job, and increasingly American farm workers are losing out. We used to use nothing but black Americans. And then the black American disappear. Crew leader Maggie Martinez has hired generations of farm workers in South Florida. We went to the Mexican families. Then the Mexican fam families start disappearing. And then the Salvadorians came along. And we used Salvadorians for a long time. And then now we got Guatemalas and a lot of Haitian people. 90 miles north of Miami, about 5,000 Guatemalans have settled in recent months, fleeing the violence and poverty in their country. Almost all are illegal immigrants. Almost all are trying to become farm workers. Guatemalans don't care how hard the work is. What they care about is making a living, feeding their families, and sending money home to Guatemala. Many of the people here are illegal. When they hear that someone is hiring illegals, they run and crowd around for those jobs. That's why many of us don't work every day. Are the Guatemalans as a group resented? Or is there any kind of hostility towards? Yes. Some of them feel that they are resented because uh, they don't belong here. And I've heard a lot of them say, well, that they do get mistreated because uh, the people figure they're from another country. Why should we be taking them in? Especially they hurt the black people real bad. And that's why you got so, you a lot of black people around here in uh, any town that need a job. And when they go and get one, you got all these damn Guatemalas over there that when you got them up. They get these Guatemalas to go out there and do that work for real, real dirt cheap. It's a good thing, it's a bad thing, because I know they got to eat, but also the other fellow man got to eat too. That was over here first. I work hard, and let's say they give you a job that you can't do, and I can, I suppose you will be envious of me, or something like that. Workers are scrambling for whatever works available, and they view as the enemy not the employer who won't pay them a decent wage, but the group that is coming in and is perceived as taking their job away. Greg Shell, a lawyer for Florida Rural Legal Services, has worked with farm workers for 10 years. Undocumented aliens continue to flow into Florida and other agricultural states uh, and has continued to uh, provide that oversupply of labor which gives the farmer exactly what he wants. Uh, a workforce he can guarantee will work for the price he's willing to offer. Almost all Guatemalan field hands are undocumented aliens. Today in Florida, an estimated 25% of farm workers are illegal immigrants. This despite the immigration reforms passed by Congress in 1986 that made it illegal for farmers to employ undocumented workers. The idea of immigration reform was 
uh, one of the cornerstones was we were going to legalize people here and from here henceforth seal the borders hermetically or otherwise to ensure that there would not be this constant influx of foreign workers. Gene McNeary, the newly appointed head of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, is responsible for enforcing the Immigration Reform Act called IRCA. The numbers of people coming across the border clearly uh, have reduced. The numbers of apprehensions have been cut in half, which is it's one of those nebulous statistics, but it's, uh, it's a clear indication that, uh, that IRCA and the employer sanctions has had an impact, has had an effect um, in, in taking away the magnet that attracted people to come into the country for jobs. All the figures show that the illegal immigration, while it initially dipped, after the passage of the law is back higher than it ever was. And as always, these workers often congregate in agriculture where very few questions are asked about you when you go to apply for the job, uh, so long as you can pick the fruit or the vegetables. According to the Center for Immigration Studies in Washington, the results of immigration reform were mixed in the first two years. But today, the flow of undocumented workers into American agriculture is as great or greater than before the law. In Florida, where there are literally thousands of unregistered workers, many of them taking jobs uh, away from competitors in the field, is there going to be more enforcement in Florida now? I don't agree with your premise uh, in that regard. I think that, uh, first of all, those people, statistics show that even the illegals who get a job illegally, add to the economy and create more jobs. It's a strange phenomenon, and I'm not sure that uh, every craftsman out there believes that, but that's what the statistics show. It's killing us. They're running us out of there. But those Guatemalans, they kind of uh, say, hey, you know, if you pay him three thirty-five an hour, you can pay me three dollars an hour. You know, I'll take three dollars an hour, or I'll take two ninety-five an hour. It don't matter. Guatemalans, they don't, they don't care really. There's an unlimited supply of workers in the third world that'll work for anything above starvation. They're in what we call next best opportunity wage is uh, nearly zero. This Professor Marshall like Barry of Florida International University has completed a 10-year study of Florida's agricultural economy. The large numbers of undocumented people continue to come into Florida every day. Employers will lower the wages, and then if you refuse to accept those wages, they'll hire a man who's hungry or someone who's desperate to work. It's unlimited. The labor's unlimited. We're at a big disadvantage. Jack Campbell's family farmed in Florida for generations. He's now the spokesman for the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. I mean, if you've got an American worker, uh, American workers that uh, that are trying to get out there and make a living, and they've got they've got all these other people coming on top of them all the time, trying to take their jobs away from them, it's not a condition in which in which an industry, any kind of an industry, is is going to take a hard look at uh, at additional uh, benefits and in, 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 in pay pay scales. You know that. Are wages paid for farm laborers set at a fair level, do you think? Um, fair according to what? I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that, that uh, uh, there probably are times when um, the crops aren't too good, and uh, even though we have a fairly um, uh, adequate um, peace rate, that, that there are times when they don't make so much, but uh, boy, there are times when they're making, you know, a uh, uh, hundred, hundred twenty dollars a day. A good young fellow picking tomatoes can really, really move along. And uh, um, again, it, it depends on on uh, on how hard you work. Wage rates right now in Florida are between one half to one third in real purchasing power terms of what they were in 1967. So what we're talking about is a wage today that will buy for exactly the same amount of work and effort from a farm worker between one half to one third of the amount that it bought in the 1960s. Elizabeth Whitley of the American Farm Bureau Federation in Washington is the chief lobbyist for farmers on Capitol Hill. 
I don't know what kind of data he's based his conclusions on. But I would say that profitability among farmers ranges widely, and it depends on the commodity, the weather, the year, the trade. My understanding is, based on U.S. government data, that average worker wages have continued to rise. But, says Professor Barry, factor in inflation, and the rise in farm worker wages disappears and becomes a net loss, especially compared to wages for other kinds of unskilled labor. What is strange to agriculture and unique to agriculture is this falling real wage and the falling proportionate income that farm workers earn in relation to their employers. That's, that is really quite unique. Farms that use large numbers of migrant workers to harvest the crops are not run by mom and pop anymore. They're run by corporations. Even to the extent they're family-owned, they're run as businesses. The large producers, the large farmers, are very effective politically in the halls of Congress, the halls of the state legislature. Farm workers have no lobby. Farm workers are not anyone's constituency in Congress. The farmers, the processors, have been unwilling to improve conditions and wages to make it so that workers can earn a decent living. In January, President George Bush came to Florida to address the American Farm Bureau's annual convention and to Thank salute you. farmers' economic progress. Surpluses have declined dramatically, and most of our good land has been brought back into production. Net farm income reached a record level last year. And the share of income that came from market sales continued to grow. Agriculture in Florida is big and politically powerful, a multi-billion dollar business that vies with tourism as the state's number one industry. Over the years, Florida has enacted several laws protecting farm workers. But their advocates claim lobbying by the growers has reduced their effectiveness. Florida is still a right-to-work state, and farm workers are the only workers still not protected by the National Labor Relations Act when they try to organize. Of Florida's 200,000 farm workers, only 900 are protected by a union contract. This winter, Baltimore Velasquez and Flock came to South Florida following the migration of their members from the Midwest, taking the union's first steps to organize farm workers here against the forces of Florida agriculture. When the workers see an opportunity to change their conditions, there's no doubt in my mind that they're going to go for it. Absolutely no doubt at all. And the workers want to be organized. They want to be able to, to um, because it's, it's, it's a simple question of do you want something better for your family? And the workers here in Florida, they're desperate for some change. They only, I only know one price right now, unless cucumbers. Fernando Cuevas is Baltimore's top lieutenant and heads Flock's organizing effort in Florida. About half of the membership that Flock has lives out of Florida. That's one reason that I, I'm here to try and find them so that we can work with them on contract administrations and the other thing is I'm, I'm trying to uh, set the stage to do some real organizing in this area. We have to organize with all different ethnic groups that are involved now. In the state of Florida, you have to because they're all farm workers. They're getting exploited just the same. And I think it's important to bring them in all in together. Otherwise, the industry will use them to divide us against each other or undermine us against each other. So it's important to organize them all. I can't do it by myself. I need a lot of help. The state of Florida is big. And that's where I'm hoping that today we can get some... At a meeting with leaders from several community organizations other, supporting other, farm workers, uh, Fernando that, found mostly skepticism. And, uh, and also a lot of participation. Nobody will fund the kind of activity that you're talking about. There's got to be ways. There's got to be ways that uh, I can bring a meeting of farm workers that at least you can sponsor it and make sure you feed them and, and get them gas transportation for some kind of training through your programs. How does the union get around um, being the, the new crew boss? There's no, is there isn't any way that we, that the union would be the boss, same as the crew leader or the grower. One of my jobs to, that I'm doing right now is without, with your help or without your help is 
I'm building organizing committees. Bottom line, it takes worker participation and the workers make the decision. We're all trying to break that dependency. We're all, we all talk about it together whenever we get together about helping people get the power to stand on their own two feet and stand up and make their own decisions and participate together and make and work as a group and uh, I don't think it can happen within a year or two or or even a few more it's going to take time you can get right there but uh, I believe that today I planted the first seed and only time will tell now the union they recognize the worker and then the rest will come of no greater pressure lobby, so-called, in Washington than the farm group. In all the... the in 1960, the, the Secretary of Labor, James Mitchell, told Edward R. Murrow that the way to help farm workers was through political action. As a citizen, uh, in or out of this office, uh, I propose to continue to raise my voice uh, until uh, the country recognizes that it has an obligation to do something for them. Harvest of Shame sparked congressional action on the farm workers' plight. Over the years, there have been bills giving farm workers the minimum wage, safe transportation, and improved housing, and laws aimed at protecting them against discrimination, abusive employment practices, and pesticides. Twelve major pieces of legislation since the early 60s. California Congressman Howard Berman has been an advocate for farm workers for nearly 20 years. The progress he sees has been slow and grudging. Uh, historically, I think it's important to mention, farm workers have always been the last American workers to ever get any of the benefits. Uh, they were exempted from minimum wage for years. They never had workers' compensation. They were the last to be covered by unemployment insurance. It was only a couple of years ago that that we even required that they have uh, toilets in the fields for the farm workers. At the Department of Labor, which must implement most farm worker legislation, Assistant Secretary Bill Brooks says enforcement is his top priority. I was participated in three uh, unannounced uh, investigations in housing, and what I found in two of those situations were deplorable and, in my judgment, unacceptable for any American. We have laws that are on the books, and that for those people who are abiding by the laws, they are fine. And those that aren't, if, uh, if we find you, we're going to firmly, fairly uh, enforce those laws. According to recent statements by the department, they have the equivalent of 43 full-time persons nationwide to enforce farm worker protective laws, not even enough for one person in each state. In a state like Florida, they could use 43 in Florida alone and not start to deal with all the problems. They play at the edges uh, of these laws. Uh, they, uh, they, they enforce certain kinds of paperwork requirements uh, to some extent. But on the real substantive uh, uh, protections that deal with wages, that deal with fundamental economic questions, uh, the Department of Labor is terribly negligent, uh, fearful of the clout of the agricultural industry. Last winter in Tampa, Florida, the Department of Labor itself became the target of a protest led by Flock, opposing a federal program called H-2A, which allows some farmers to import foreign workers. H-2A, do not give our jobs away. We don't need H-2As. We just need a better wage for the workers we already have here in this country, and especially in this state. American agriculture was terrified of immigration reform, and they were afraid that they would lose their historic oversupply of labor. That would force them to do what every other American employer has to do when they have trouble finding workers, raise wages and improve working conditions. So built into the immigration package were a number of provisions to allow growers to keep supplementing that workforce from abroad. Uh, one was an expanded and streamlined temporary foreign worker program, the so-called H-2A program. Our contention is, and Congress believed us and endorsed the concept when they included it in the Immigration Reform and Control Act, that if a grower could demonstrate he couldn't find Americans who were ready, willing, able, and available at time and place of need to perform the work, then a grower could bring in foreign workers. We're totally against the H-2A. We do not want foreign workers to come and take our jobs of our people. 
Cuevas was protesting an application to import 900 workers from Mexico to pick oranges for Oakley Farms. Oakley said it could find no American pickers who would accept 65 cents a box, a rate approved by the Department of Labor. The Labor Department hardly ever gets involved in recruiting workers. The only time they get involved in recruiting uh, farm workers is when a bad company like Oakley cannot keep workers available because they pay so cheap. They say there are no domestic workers to do the jobs, and that's simply not the case. There are at least two or three workers for each available agricultural job in the state of Florida. As the picketers marched outside the hotel where the Department of Labor was holding a national conference, reporters moved inside to confront labor officials with the farm workers' complaints. I think it's important that we understand very clearly the purpose of the H-2A law that Congress passed. And that purpose is when we cannot find American workers to go and harvest the crops. The crops would rot in the fields. There's no reason in the world why any more additional labor should come into a sector where real wages have fallen over the last 20 to 30 years. I mean, that's a sign that there's an excess supply of work. What we, what we wanted to make sure of under H-2A is that when we bring in the alien workers, that we set those minimum wage rates so that it does not depress the wages that American workers are paid. Once the know, government sets the wage, at say 65 cents a box in citrus like they did recently, which is one half of the real purchasing power of 1967, our government says, well, Americans, if you want the job, work for one half of what you made in 1967. And if you don't, we're bringing people from the third world. Americans who show up and say, I like to work, but I, I need to work for 85 cents or I need to work for 95 cents, it's just as if they never showed up under the way the immigration law is being implemented. We want to be able to talk with each other. Eventually, DOL officials allowed a group of protesters, including Flox Fernando Cuevas, inside to hear their complaints. Is this a, is, is this a publicly funded meeting? No, no sir. This is a, a federal government meeting. But that's okay. publicly funded. Sir, please. Although the meeting was officially closed to journalists, Frontline was able to record the debate. Oakley has applied again for another 942 workers. That's, you know, in my words, that's bullshit to even receive such an application. I'm sorry. You know, I might want it different, you might want it different. That's the way the law is. We know. We also know another thing. If we go to a farmer that's a cheap, paying farmer or abuses of our labor, we want to stay away from that farmer. Now that farmer is going to be short of labor, I guarantee you. But it isn't because there's no workers in this country. The three-hour meeting was inconclusive, but a few weeks later, Oakley Farms withdrew its application. Oakley officials would not talk to Frontline, but told the Labor Department it was bad weather, not union pressure, that led them to cancel their request for foreign workers. Cesar Chavez taught us that real well uh, in this movement. You see, the opposition is going to have power and they're going to have money. And that power is fueled by money. And so um, they're going to have to invest their money to fight us. And, and uh, as Caesar puts it, it's our time against their money. And as long as we continue to do it, um, we're going to win because there's a lot more time than there is money. This year in Florida, there was a freeze, killing oranges, lemons, squash, and beans. It had happened before. This year in Florida, there was a freeze, killing beans, tomatoes, celery, corn. Its byproduct was a bread line. Migratory farm workers are not eligible for unemployment insurance. This happened in the United States in 1960. This happened in the United States in the freeze of 1990. What time did you get here to get I online? came at 4 o'clock this morning. What do you expect to get inside? Uh, help. Any kind of help I can. Did you have any savings before the freeze? No. We don't got any savings. Well, you know, you do the best you can with what you got. Just live for day, day by day, I guess. They remain excluded from most basic benefit programs that other Americans take for granted. Americans almost take for granted now that they will have health insurance provided with their job. Farm workers never receive such a benefit. That they'll have vacation days paid. Farm workers never receive that. That they will have sick pay. 
farm workers don't work, they don't get paid, that they will have a pension when they grow old. Farm workers don't receive any pensions. Farm workers remain outside the mainstream. Left us out there, nothing for us to do. The closest thing that's coming up is going to be the beans. So that's 40-day beans, you know. It takes us about, what, eight more weeks, seven more weeks before we can start doing anything, really. This ain't no life, really, you know. I've been through it, my wife's been through it, and we wouldn't like our kids to go through it. We don't know what's going to happen from one day to another. That's the way we leave it. You know, we got to leave one day at a time. See what happens. For Pedro Silva's family, the entire winter in Florida was a disappointment. They were able to pick beans, but the crop was so poor, they each made only about $5 a day. Now the Silvas are back on the migrant trail again in Georgia for the onion harvest. They are hoping this will be a better year. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night.